Hey, so in this video, I'm gonna show you the basic signal flow in Ableton Live. This also applies to other DAWs and even other mixers when it comes to music production. Um, but Ableton Live has a few different names for specific things. We're gonna dive into the basic signal flow. I'm gonna show you how sound is routed by default, how you can customize it a little bit um, to whatever you're trying to do. The sound originally starts in Ableton Live on a track and comes from what we would call the clip or audio input. And so that's gonna start here at the basic level. So we're at session view right now, and I've got two tracks. I've got one, it's just this audio clip is being played. This is the origin of the sound. It's at the clip level. Or um, for this MIDI track, I've got some notes being played, um, which is actually from this instrument. So Ableton's MIDI instrument is the beginning of that sound for a MIDI track. The audio clip is the original sound from the starting point on an audio track. So that's basically what these are doing. So this is really number one when it comes to sound being generated in Ableton Live. The next part of the signal flow is that sound is directly being flowed into number two, which is going to be our device chain on what we would call the insert of a track. If I double click on the track, we can see for this audio track, there's nothing in here. We haven't laid any devices or effects. Um, if I was going to do that, um, then I could you know, go into my audio effects folder, drag something on here. Once it loads, I can put on the dry wet. So it's blending a certain amount of this signal of this reverb device on the insert of this track. The way we stack these devices on either an audio track or a MIDI track uh, makes a big difference on the order from left to right in which they're placed. So right now I have a color limiter on this track and if I turn up the loudness of it and I compress it and I put an auto filter behind it, this auto filter is gonna be listening to whatever is to the left of it. So that's something just to keep in mind. Not that I would always put a limiter at the beginning of the chain, but this gives you an idea. You can click and move them around. So that's step two for how sound is really generated. Um, the next step would be in step three. Now, let me show you a quick example of what this looks like. So if we go back into Ableton Live, you have these mixer controls, which is in this section right here. And with those mixer controls, we can route a track to wherever we want. By default, the audio going out of one of these tracks with all of these insert effects stacked on it, all of that sound is gonna be routed to audio two. So this is coming out of this track and the default is the master. So by default, these tracks are going directly to the master. And if we wanted to stack more effects on the master, it's going to be listening to basically all of the sound generated from these tracks. Now I could choose to do some fancy routing if I wanted to. Uh, Ableton Live makes it really easy to route from one track into another track. Let's say I create a new audio track and now I can choose audio two. I can route it to that new three audio track. And now the sound is gonna go directly out of this track into this track if I arm the track. That's basically uh, 101 as far as track routing goes on the inserts. So that's where we would get this right here as far as this fader goes. Now we also have um, our pre and our post when it comes to our sends. So we have our send knobs right here. And these send knobs are automatically created with two return tracks in any new Ableton Live project you open up. So we have our send A and our send B. This is taking the output, like we showed with the audio two, this is taking the output signal and it's running it into these effects tracks. So you're taking the dry signal of this track and you're adding another layer of volume on these return track effects. Now let's go over to arrangement view. We have all the exact same mixer controls and arrangement view on these tracks that we do over here in session view. So it's just two different ways of looking at them, two different ways of playing these clips and sounds. Now we have our send A, we have our send B over here as well. We have our panning, our volume, which is what we would call our fader. And then we have these return tracks I just showed you. So by default, the return tracks are set to post. You can also click on them and change them to pre. Basically what this means is this is how it's going to play back through the return tracks, whatever is going on with the fader on the MIDI or audio tracks that we are performing with. So if I were to say, for example, crank up my send A, let's use the horns and turn it up to all the way to zero, which is hundred percent. And I play this, we're getting that effect. You can add some reverb or delay. Now, 
with this post effect, if I was to change it to pre, and I was to turn down the volume all the way, so we should just pull this all the way down. So typically, if I was to solo, say, this horn section, you're still hearing it over here on the reverb because we have the send at 100%, but the volume's all the way down. So the return track in pre just means it's going to only listen to the completely wet signal of the effect, regardless of whatever um, the fader volume is at. If I pull this down, we're not getting anything. If I turn up my send A, it's only listening to your sends at that point. It's not listening to the fader or the volume of the output. So that's what pre and post is. Um, there's a lot of different fancy ways you can use that. I'm not gonna go deeper into it. Um, maybe you didn't want the dry sound of a track. You just wanted to only listen to the reverb or delay or something for a special effect. That, that could be useful. So that's basically what's going on here with your pre and post and using your sends. If you are using another DAW or another software program, they probably refer to your return tracks as an aux track. So instead of calling it a return track, basically Ableton just calls it return. It's an, it's an aux, so same exact thing. Now let's look at down here, we have also the ability to route tracks to a group. So let's look at that. Now this could be useful, say I have a couple other instruments, maybe I want a shaker sound of some sort. Let's go into user library, let's find a shaker. And now maybe I wanted to group multiple percussion instruments together. Let's say I add some snares and some other things. If you hold down shift and highlight multiple tracks, you can right click and choose group. Now by default, both of these tracks are being routed into the group and then that group would be going out to your master. So anything you do inside of these tracks, whether it's on the insert of the track or even using your sends, it's gonna go through your group first. Now if I grab, say, a drum bus, one common thing is I would put a drum bus on a group and I would rename this and call this my drum group. And now I'm squishing and compressing the shakers, snares, whatever else I add to inside this group with the, this kick loop we had. So. And then now I can pull down, say, the volume of that group overall. Once I have everything balanced inside the group, I can turn down the volume of the overall group if I wanted to. Maybe I'll add a little bit of reverb on that. Another thing I'm really conscious of is I don't want to build up so much sound that it's clipping the output. So let's say if I turn up this out, you'll see it starts to turn red here. And because all the sound from these tracks are being routed into this drum group, so whatever I put on the insert of the drum group, everything else is being fed into. And you can see right now, on this drum group, if I solo it, it's clipping. So just be conscious of how much sound you're building up over time through groups, just to be aware of that. We'll talk more about that in other videos as far as um, setting headroom and clipping and things. The next thing we have is what I just said. We have device chains in the group, which I added that drum bus. So that's where that comes from. You can see this drum bus down here. The next thing we have is our device chain in the master track. We already looked at the device chain in the return track. So if you wanted to, we could obviously add additional effects and sounds to build up a, an effects chain on your return tracks that you could send stuff to. Um, but then we have our master. So our master, typically a limiter is the last thing in the chain on a master, and that's going to affect all of the tracks that we have, audio and MIDI, that are defaulted to route through the master. So yeah, obviously the same thing applies, building a chain from left to right. But yeah, tip, I'm not going to go deeper into the mastering part, but just know this is the basic order of operations and how signal flows through Ableton Live. Hopefully this makes a little more sense of all this. Um, you could also do some additional routing if you wanted to on the master and you could send the master wherever you wanted, um, which could be useful for say a live performance scenario. Maybe you wanna only send uh, the master or certain tracks to the front of house for mixing live instruments and audio. So that's a basic explanation of routing with SignalFlow and Ableton Live. Hopefully this was helpful and yeah, keep working on great tracks. I'll see you in the next video.